Welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Eric Landrum, along with Garth Newfeld, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the end stuff part of the title. This is episode number six, where Garth had the opportunity to interview Jane Hallinan from the University of West Florida in Florida. Before you hear the interview, please allow me to share some of my listening tips and some of my favorite moments from the podcast. So first off, what a lovely idea for Garth and Jane to sit down and drink wine during the recording. I kind of like that, and I'm going to steal that for when I'm doing the interviewing. Um, there are some things that Jane talked about with the High School Psychology Summit. Uh, she mentioned the acronym MACTOP, and be sure to look in the liner notes, and we'll give you some links, and we'll define those acronyms for you. Um, I, I thought it was interesting to hear about uh, the first generation challenges of going to college from her family. That's something that we see in many of our students around the country. I, I connected with and appreciate the power of story and narrative. This is kind of a recurring theme, theme that comes through my life and my work. In fact, I was honored in 2014 to be the president of STP, the Society for the Teaching of Psychology, APA Division Two. And my presidential address that year was about the power of story. I know other people around the country, such as Maureen McCarthy and Karen Brockie, they've talked about in their own presidential addresses, uh, this kind of same theme. And it's so powerful. I think there's more scholarship that needs to be needed and needs to be shared with teachers more often about the power of story. Um, Jane mentioned a little bit, it was interesting about that, is there still discouragement about uh, being a teacher when you're being trained in graduate school? And sadly, just from the conversations I have with people around the country, like Missy Beers at Ohio State University, uh, the answer is usually yes. Uh, those large R1 doctoral institutions are, you know, tend to want to crank out researchers like they're being trained by. And so sometimes uh, teaching gets the short shrift. And so I think there's some work to be done in our discipline to support those individuals who are going to be going to be researchers, but likely to have a teaching component in that research position. I think that's an important thing to remember. Uh, this was a great example of the importance of faculty development as you are a new faculty member. And so Jane landing at Alverno and the whole notion of assessment became, I believe, an integral part of her life because it was so early in her career. And uh, she mentioned the master's level pipeline and that issue. And I thought that was interesting as well. Lastly, I just want to focus on the, the notion that she talked about with, with regards to magic. Um, she tries in each of her class sessions and each of her courses to recreate the magic that she experienced herself as an undergraduate student. And I, I you know, I kind of like that, um, that depiction, it, it's really not magic. It's, it, it takes a lot of faculty development. It's the combination of active learning strategies, utilizing evidence-based instructional practices, but putting it all together and putting it in the context of the students in the room and the size of the course and the level of the course, it seems to me that, that to make those things come together, uh, it almost is magical uh, when it all works and it works well. And I think we get better at that over time later in our careers. And so, please, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast as much as I did. Enjoy. <laughs> Let me put this on because... Um... I, I was just telling you that uh, I'm glad you weren't here to witness me opening this bottle of wine because I <laughs> murdered the cork. I think it was a bad cork. It came all the way okay, from France. Um, so Now I'm looking for pieces. Well, mine's, I, mine's cork free. That's why I poured mine first. I don't know if okay. you noticed that. It was kind of rude. But <laughs> unless unless there's cork in the wine, which I, I'm ha I'll am happily drink it after a day like today. Yeah. Mm. Uh, this is Garth, and I am here with Jane Hallinan, uh, the Jane Hallinan from... Tell us where you're from. I'm from the University of West Florida in Pensacola, Florida. There it is. Um, and we are at the high school summit for huh, the, the summit. Summit for high school psychology. That's it. Right. Uh, we're in Ogden, Utah. I do know that part. And uh, what a great group of people. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. How many of these have you done these kinds of things? Oh, I think this might be my fourth or my fifth APA gathering. Can you run us through them? Um, I think I started out at uh, the St. Mary's Conference, which was back in 1990s. That was one of the first things I ever did. Mm. 
Um, then the Psychology Partnerships Project, affectionately known as P3, which was at James Madison University, which happened to be where I was the director of the School of Psychology at that time. Um, I did the uh, SNAP last year, and it seems like there should be one other tucked in there. I did not do the Blueprint session in um, in Puget Sound. Oh, you didn't? I didn't. Uh, I decided as one of the, I, I have to say, one of the gray hairs now in psychology, I thought it was a reasonable thing to do for some of the old generation to step aside to make room for newer voices. Interesting. And I discovered that I just couldn't stand not being part of it, which is why I, I did not show that large S for here. I said, right. oh, high school people, I'm in, yeah. because I really enjoy working with high school teachers. And taking the spot of a young psychologist. I don't faculty. care. <laughs> I was generous once. That's all over now. That's it. We get one from you. You know, um, why don't you give, give me a sec because I forgot my, my pen and my pad of paper over there and that sure. usually help me, helps me as we go. So um, th- we're just going to do this live while I grab it. Okay. Okay. And now he's coming back. He's, he's loaded with a pen. We should be ready to go. We are, we are maybe ready to go. Okay. So uh, Jane, I, uh, I came in, I, I've been teaching psychology for about 10 years now, and mm-hmm. at some point, I heard about Jane Hallinan. Did I don't you? Know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and I think it was probably um, through, uh, you know, colleagues, like uh-huh. Sue Franz. Yes. Um, One of the world's great women, I have to say. R- yeah. Right, right. Yeah, she's all right. Um, <laughs> and and it's, it's interesting, as an early career teacher of psychology, um, you you don't necessarily get put in touch with all the resources and all the leaders in the teaching of psychology unless you have somebody who's connected to it, which is kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. But it, at That's some, true. Yeah, at some point uh, I heard about Jane Helen and then I thought, why haven't I heard about people like, and I know there's a, a few of you and you guys have been teaching together for a long time yes. and, uh, nationally. Who are, who are the rest of those, those folks? That there's you- actually a group um, that got together many years ago in uh, probably one of the first regional teaching conferences, uh, MACTOP, Mid-America Conference of Teachers of Psychology that happened in Evansville, Indiana. Hmm. And so um, every fall we would all journey to southern Indiana for this tribal experience. And that ended up, I found my tribe early in my career. And so the people that uh, I bonded with early included Randy Smith, Dave Johnson, Bill Addison, Bill Hill. You'll notice I'm naming a lot of male names. Mm -hmm. So there, Barney Bynes would be in that crowd. Uh Um, There was a wonderful esprit de corps. And it was amazing to me to be with people who loved teaching as much as I did yeah. and who were so generous in being able to share what they, what they did in the classroom. So I would come away from that annual event so pumped mm. uh, and, and eager to come back and share with my colleagues back in the psych department, which back then was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and so that group ended up becoming a pretty important nucleus that helped develop the leadership in the Society for Teaching of Psychology. I think almost every person I named in that group, probably every person became president of wow. uh, STP at one time or another. Yeah. And, um, and those relationships continue to be pretty robust. Mm. Let me backtrack. Uh, sure. You, you mentioned uh, that that was a pretty male-heavy list. Oh, lordy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Can you what what's that all about? What was it like to be a well yeah, a teacher? It, the uh, let's let's throw in the word zeitgeist. Mm-hmm. That at the time I went to graduate school back in um, in the seventies. Really, I'm that old. Um, uh, when I entered my class in graduate school, I was the only woman in my class of ten, wow. and I had only one female instructor professor the entire time I was in graduate school. So the imbalance that we see now between genders is it it was just completely flipped on its head back then. Wow. So since most of the teachers were also male, uh the predominant gender at teaching conferences male. male. And since I was raised as a tomboy, I sort of fit in with the guys. And I remember um, in the socializing that one does when you go to conferences like this, I would, I would phone home to my husband, and he'd say, so how many men were you out with tonight? And sometimes I'd say, 12. Um, 
because there just weren't other women in my cohort to do that. Um, Fortunately, the the men that I hung out with were very generous and um, and supportive, mm-hmm. and I, I mean I, I think the world of them and do everything I can to see them when it's possible. Right. Still, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. Um, uh, now, when I go to national teaching things, uh, I tend to I don't know why come away with a lot of good uh, girlfriends from. Oh yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. is kind of flipped, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's just who, and well, there, maybe that says more about me. But there are more. It, it may say something about you, but it does say that the gender disproportion. And notice, I'm saying that instead of the feminization of psychology, which I despise. I despise uh. that term. Um, that we really are seeing many more women enter into the teaching of psychology, psychology at large. Yep. So men are the scarce commodity now, as opposed to women being that. Do you when have I a started. theory, or have you heard about why that might be? Um, why that gender flip mm-hmm. happened? Hmm. I've thought about it a lot, mostly when I get angry, when people <laughs> talk about, isn't it terrible that there are so many women? I don't see that that's automatically a disadvantage. Um, but I recognize that there's a, a bit of a fear historically when a uh, profession becomes identified with women, that there tends to be a bit of an economic nosedive in the value of mm. salaries and that sort of thing. I don't think that has happened. Mm. Um, then again, if you look at some of the reports on uh, being published about incoming or starting salaries in psychology, mm-hmm. they're among the lowest starting salaries in the liberal arts. That's very interesting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and so the fact that we're churning out mostly women to go into the workforce. That's not really a surprise, but I think it's also important that we recognize um, doing what you love, doing your passion, Mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a lot of money to worry about. No. But if you're satisfied because of the choice you've made, and I have to say I couldn't have chosen a better lifestyle Mm -hmm. or or, um, way to spend my professional time than doing what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I want to talk more about that, uh, but I want to go back before we get to the teaching and how you chose that as uh, a profession and and then what it's meant to you. Um, I wouldn't mind going back to the beginning and just like hearing where you grew up and family, wherever you want to go with it. Eventually, we're going to end up how we got here today. But yeah. Um, Yeah, I I grew up um, uh, the second of two daughters in a lower middle class family. My folks were both in the Navy in World War II. They married, and like a lot of people did in in that uh, era, they quickly started having family and then had all kinds of economic problems, as uh, returning vets did even back then. Uh, My dad was a Studebaker man. I grew up in South Bend, Indiana. And since I was supposed to be Charles Michael Simmons... (laughs) Instead of Jane Elizabeth Simmons, um, my dad pretty much treated me like a boy, for which I was really grateful. Yeah. Uh, so just as one simple example, um, I, I was the one who had to go to the golf course with him. Uh-huh. So at age 11, when most little girls are still doing girly things, I was on the golf course trying to figure out how to keep my head down. <laughs> and, um, and that turned out to be just a, an, an incredible asset as I grew later into professional roles. I think it also um, made me more fearless mm. about what I would take on, um, that uh, he, he was a, a great encouraging um, force in my life, that uh, he, he believed I could do anything, so I believed I could do anything. Mm. Um, and they both valued higher education, even though they were both Uh, high school graduates, they knew higher education was important. And so when I finished my undergraduate degree at uh, Butler University in Indianapolis and said, I want to go to graduate school, they said, what is that? And (laughs) why, you mean you're not done? I said, no, because I want to be a psychologist, and that means I've got to go for a lot longer. They said, really? And my dad, during that era, would tell people I was in the 19th grade or the 22nd grade. Sure. Or, um, and my family, because of that, um, I, I stem from two different strains of hillbillies. <laughs> and I think there's an Indian tribe thrown in there someplace. I have to do that Ancestry.com thing to find that out for sure. Um, but there, there was no recognition at all of what psychology was. 
So I found a real challenge in my family trying to explain what, what I was so passionate about um, to the point that when I tried to explain it to my grandmother, uh, I overheard her telling a neighbor that I was studying to be a brain surgeon because that was the closest that she could get to what yeah. I was talking about. Um, so I, when you yeah. when you were uh, in your undergraduate doing your undergraduate degree at Butler, did yeah. you go into psychology immediately? I did didn't. You know? Okay, no, uh, I never. I didn't have the access to a psych class in high school. Mm-hmm. That was not an option. Yep. we didn't have it way back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I graduated high school in 1968, so that, I mean, a li- long time ago. Um, Everybody, wa- everybody's doing the math right now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to we'll be turning 67 <laughs> in about three days, so there you go. You don't have to do the math now. Um, I, I actually was a, a pretty good writer in high school. I was an editor of the school paper, and mm. so I decided I wanted to be a journalist or a playwright. That would have been cool. But I elected journalism, and about six weeks in, I went, what the hell? I I don't like any part of this. And at the same time, ended up in a class with um, a transformative intro teacher. Um, Not because, I'm going to say I didn't model much of who I am as a teacher after him, except he had a way with a story. And because his narratives were so powerful, I found it easy to learn from him. And there was a a kind of a light bulb moment for me in psychology, um, a transformative concept, and that was defense mechanisms, Hmm. that there was something about learning that people don't tell themselves the truth to protect themselves, and everybody does it, and oh, wait, oh, even me. Hmm. Wait a minute, you mean I don't have a handle on my reality either? I found that so fascinating that I thought, I am home. This, this is what I want to do, and so I wanted to become a clinician. That, you know, I'm one of those psych majors that wants to help people, mm-hmm. and that was my pathway in yeah. graduate school. I was a clinical psychologist, but when I entered graduate school at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee mm-hmm. in the class of nine men and me, um, I had a teaching assistantship where I would uh, conduct six discussion sections that, that supported a major lecturer in either developmental or introductory psychology. And I found I was completely fascinated by the experimental nature of what I could learn from doing um, a, a game plan six times mm. so that I would try an idea out, and by the end of the week, I felt like I had honed down. So same topic, and same you're going to get six groups of six, students. I got to do six groups oh, of thirty, unbelievable. and Perfect. I got now I'm going to try stuff out. And I, I, what I was surprised by is how much I loved it, mm-hmm. and that students, my students, gave me positive feedback about how helpful it was being. I thought, well, this is this is kind of interesting, and I thought this teach. I never thought I'd be a teacher, <sighs> but yet this was there was a hook. Uh, there was a hook set just like I was a fish. Yeah. Um, now you're talking my language. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And then I did an internship uh-huh. because, again, my plan was world's greatest clinician. That's what I'm going to do because that's what I've been preparing for. But even in my clinical year, um, the thing that I enjoyed most was when I had the practicum that I had to give to my peers. Huh. It's like there, something is, something's not right here because this is not part of the plan. And I also was being encouraged by people not to talk about liking teaching. Why? Why? Because if you're in an R1 setting, a research-intensive mm. setting, the goal of uh, being an academic mm. is establishing a research program, getting grants, teaching to support the fact that you're going to do this scholarly work. And I can't say that I burned for wanting to do research. My research was in attachment theory, pacifier use. I mean, it was interesting and I could do it, and I could do it well, but I, I, didn't, I didn't burn for it. Mm. Um, and yet, later on, when I eventually became a faculty member, I found the scholarship of teaching and learning was exactly to my liking, that I loved. That's what I discovered in graduate school, the, the tinkering I was doing in my six sessions to try to figure out what was the best way I could help them retain this information and make it useful in their lives is, is pretty much the, the uh, ethos that drives what I do today. Yeah. So did you end up grad- graduating as a clinician? I graduated as a clinician. Uh-huh. 
And in fact, um, by the time my internship was over, I realized that I probably would be happier as a poor academic than a rich clinician. Mm -hmm. So I started applying for jobs and, and didn't get any. And as a consequence, one of the, the um, jobs that I didn't get, uh, the person who interviewed me said, well, not this job, but I happen to be a consulting psychologist at a school for profoundly disabled children, and we need a school director, and you've got the background. I didn't have the background. I mean, I had a Ph.D. in psych, but I'd never even had a disability class. You've got, you've got, you could do this, and because of my dad saying I could do anything, I said, oh, okay, I'll do that. <clears throat> so for um, two years, I was a, technically a principal at a special school. Wow. And learned a lot, mm -hmm. um, especially when you're starting from not knowing anything. Uh, having to do leadership, management, payroll, budget, um, <clears throat> dealing with unhappy parents, dealing with children who were acting out, uh, writing grants. I, I, I feel like I did it all in two years. But I, was, I, kept, I just kept missing the particular kind of excitement that happens in the classroom mm -hmm. when... Everything comes together, and there's magic. Yeah. I, mi I miss that. So when I finally did land my first job, um, that was at Alverno College in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and was probably one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me uh, because it was a very special place that shaped how I think about teaching. Mm. Um, it's a school that became well-known because 40-some years ago, I might have the years wrong now, they stopped giving students grades and turned their curriculum into a performance-based curriculum. And that really fit philosophically what I had found experimentally when I was uh, in grad school. And so I, I was there for 17 years. Wow. Okay. We're coming back to, uh, it was Alvino? Alverno. Alverno. Yeah. Alverno, Alverno College, Milwaukee. Alverno College, Milwaukee. Women's Milwaukee. College, um, uh, absolutely terrific place huh. with a huge reputation because for people who know about assessment, a lot of people point to Alverno as the reason assessment has become so big. They were one of the first places to okay. do well, something Okay, well, I want to go back to some other things you sure. mentioned. But why? But before we do, because yeah. I'm really interested, if, if people are looking to a school like Alverno or we're looking to a school like Alverno to talk about assessment – then why haven't more schools gone with that kind of a model? Oh, because uh, the model is terrifically labor-intensive. Mm -hmm. um, just as one example, uh, when students graduate and they apply to graduate schools, you, what do you do with the GPA line? Right. Well, you, you put not applicable. And then if, um, if people don't know about Alverno, sometimes that means that application goes in the do not consider pile because yep. it looks like a frivolous application. But instead, what the faculty have to, had to do was write a narrative transcript, which is, here's the student and here's what she can do. And so really articulating all of the skills and talents that you saw over the course of the four years that you had the student. Wow. So that, and, you know, with a few graduates, that's, that was some pretty intensive stuff. Now, and something I know about your teaching currently is, um, and I think every good teacher is student-centered, but I see you with your, teacher, er, with your students, you bring them to conferences. I do, and, yeah. And, and you love it. And I do. And it's really apparent, and they love you. And so did that student-centeredness really come from those years working, like, because what I hear you saying is that the teachers are really involved with the students. They have to be watching closely enough that they can write a letter Right. of recommendation right. to a graduate program, right? right? Um, I'm going to say I, I probably was oriented to being student-centered temperamentally, mm -hmm. and the fact that I landed in an environment where everyone was, yeah. and they were also very astute about what was going on in higher education, mm -hmm. um, meant that I was able to uh, have those philosophies thrive mm -hmm. and really become the foundation of who I was yeah. in a much more thoughtful, reflective way. Right. So you ended up at an institution that had probably a lot of support for you as well. Um, I, a lot of professional development support. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. 
terrible salaries, but a great professional. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm talking more. <laughs> yeah, and I'm talking more along the lines of you said that you know a lot of people are student centered there, so yes. you got to observe it. Yeah, and 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 people modeled it right. for you as a as an early right. career teacher. Well, and I think just as a, a point of contrast for most college and university settings. Um, during the time that I was at Alverno, we would start the school year with one week's worth of faculty development, one solid week's work, mm. where we would meet and talk about teaching and what's going on in higher ed and explore whatever skill development was going on, what's a new strategy for doing that. In between semesters, we'd do another week. Mm -hmm. And in the summer, we would be hosting workshops where other people would come and learn about what we would do. And so the amount of time... Oh, and we'd spend every... Is it, it was either every Friday or every other Friday in faculty development. That's a lot of faculty development That's time. That's a lot. Yeah. 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 Well, I was um, I started out at at Highline College, as mm. you know, yeah. full time, and and they uh, it was a very supportive, uh, close knit department. That and every Friday we got together just because we wanted to get together, right. and we would have three hour meetings to talk about teaching. And um, I can't imagine where I would have been if I was thrown into an institution where I was I isolated and didn't have that kind of support. Um, so I guess after a career of having, uh, you know, that kind of professional development support and well, at least for the first couple decades of your career, what do you think about, uh, early career psychologists or teachers of psychology who don't feel that support at their institution or who don't, um, I, I, we come to a week like this where we're working together and there, everybody's excited about teaching. That's right. what we like to talk about right. at breaks. That's what we're talking it's about. It's our tribe. Right. Exactly. Right. So when people can't find their tribe at their low, at their workplace, what do they do? Well, I think, um, we are so lucky in psychology because we are a discipline that makes opportunities available to people if you learn about them. So in psychology, if you're uh, operating at the community college or college level, uh, getting involved with Division II, Society for Teaching of Psychology, for me that was a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. uh, and the kinds of resources that they have been able to develop for people from e-books to a pro I love project syllabus. Yeah. Uh, when I start a new class, I always look to see what's course, there. Yeah. Um, the teaching award piece is important to be able to acknowledge people who are doing great work. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, I don't think you necessarily have to join APA. I mean, you can do, you can join uh, division two for $25 and get teaching of psych. That's worth that right there. Yep. Uh, the equivalent for high school is of course tops, which is a, an astounding group that has done wonders for being able to build that sense of community. And that's only gotten stronger, uh, due to the kinds of digital support that people can feel. I think the difference between high school and college is that I'm going to be in a department of, you know, if it's a, if it's a college, it might be a, a department of six or seven. If it's a university, it might be a department of 20 to 35, right. depends on the size. Um, but you can still feel kind of lonely yeah. if there aren't people who have the passion who love students. Mm -hmm. And sometimes fa psychology faculty don't love students. They mm -hmm. They love the discipline. They love to talk the discipline. But there's a difference between talking about the discipline, uh, yapping about the discipline, and teaching the discipline. Mm -hmm. Teaching the discipline is strategy that uh, doesn't always happen. And so I think the, the tribal piece, uh, if you find the tribe, and we've, we've got those formalized, mm -hmm. uh, that becomes very, very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I think that's the way I started out um, the podcast was saying that when I had heard of you, I, I didn't even know, you were one of the first names I'd heard about um, in this whole teaching of psychology community, mm -hmm. and then I realized there's all these resources out there, right? and there are there is a tribe out there. Um, I didn't even know I wanted to be a part of a tribe until I found them. You know what I mean? I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's, that's how it worked for me, and um, I, I guess the challenge at this point is to how do you, how do we... I heard, uh, was it Randy Ernst or somebody who was talking today about um, one of the goals of, for, for high school psychology is to get all high school psychology teachers involved in TOPS. And, Would be uh, great. Right. And so I, my, my question is, do they not know? They do not know. Right. Yeah. That seems to be a huge problem. Right. Well, uh, in most high schools, you are going to be the only person teaching psychology. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why um, it's important for the magic of face-to-face 
to be able to reach out. And I know um, many uh, states have great organizations. UTOPS, we're here in Utah. They have a very strong state uh, um, connection for TOPS, um, KTOPS in Kansas as well. Do you think that that boils down to one person, like a Kristen Whitlock? Or... Um, I, I feel fairly certain that the momentum that comes from one person's investment, knowing that it's this is important, mm-hmm. keeps it alive. Yeah. And I know enough about the teachers in Utah from how many of them I met through advanced placement that even if Kristen Whitlock were to move to a different state, which would be terrible, <laughs> probably Utops would survive because there are fabulous teachers in Utah. There sure are. Because they've built, they have built that community to build great teachers. Yeah, you know, it's funny. When I go to certain conferences or, or whatever and, and I meet, I mean, there's always a strong Wisconsin representation. Mm-hmm. At these, and, and there's a, always a strong Nebraska representation. I wonder, Correct. I wonder why that is. I, do, I often think about when I'm at these places, like, how are there so many people from Nebraska or Iowa or wherever at these places? And, and so it is, you know, I think it is these strong individuals, but there's, there's something going on where, um, where somebody's building community or, or right. they're building the tribe. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I was reminded of that today. I was talking with Kent Corrick and he and I were in Milwaukee at the same time. He's still teaching high school in, in Milwaukee. Hmm. And back then we collaborated back then. Now we're talking a lot of years ago, in uh, the Milwaukee area, teachers of psychology, we got people together, I forget if it was once or twice a year, um, partly to try to establish that pipeline Mm -hmm. issue, and uh, partly because it was a great way to be able to give high school teachers the excess textbooks that publishers were sending that we weren't asking for. Um, And he mentioned today that that, uh, that group is still meeting, which was thrilling for me to hear something that we started that long ago is still uh, viable. Yeah. So I think, I think some, some areas, I mean, that, that survived without me. Mm-hmm. Um, if Kent left, I don't know if they built the leadership infrastructure that things would carry on. Mm-hmm. But I think in the interest of um, people who are committed to trying to help a particular population, uh, leaders think about legacy and think about what needs to happen yeah. in case they get hit by a bus or, you know, how, how do you make sure that the good stuff carries on? Right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, interesting to think about the relationship between, uh, undergraduate, graduate teaching and, and high school teaching. Cause we're here this week. So we're thinking about high school teaching a lot, a but, lot. Right. And, and I think it's so important even for the, as Eric and I like to say, the dozens of listeners who are listening to this <laughs> podcast. And thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, for those who are college and university teachers who get all these textbooks, yes, there are high school teachers in your neighborhood who want those textbooks. Or it's in your true, city, right? It's true because uh, we heard stories today, and it isn't the first time I've heard the story of people who are operating out of books that are anywhere from ten to fifteen years old mm-hmm. because the school district can't afford something new, right? Um, so yeah, it's it's very important. Uh, not to, I also think it's an ethical matter that uh, college teachers who get unrequested textbooks should not then turn around to a bookseller and sell them for a profit. Now I'm saying that as an author, that mm-hmm. really yanks my chain. I worked yep. hard on that book, yep. and now you're, you're making the profit? I mean, yep. what's the ethics of that? Right. Um, but I have no problem with taking that unsolicited textbook and giving it where people are resource poor, and that's almost any high school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was talking to, um, I told you earlier that, uh, on one of these earlier podcasts, which hasn't been released yet, uh, I talked to Stephen Chu and we were talking about how, can I just say, I love Stephen Chu. I know you, he knows you told it. me off. Mike. He knows it. I'm just going to say it again out loud. So everybody knows I love him. <laughs> and we were talking about how generous folks in psychology in the teaching of psychology are just generous. And we were, I think we probably talked about project syllabus and everything else, but, um, really a generous community. And, um, and so, you know, when I hear even something today like um, when, when I see college and university and high school teachers working together, um, and, I th- and I've talked to a lot of my high school teaching friends who just they don't have the support when they're one person in an right. entire school. Uh, and I don't think it's their responsibility to reach out to community colleges and universities in the area to find maybe some support. But I really do think it's a, 
it's really valuable if a community college or a university, if those folks who are involved in the teaching and the national kind of teaching of psychology uh, reached out to their local high school psychology fa- or psychology teachers to help them connect to to the tribe. I do too, and I think what often gets missed is the advantage is not just for the high school person. Nope. Uh, the advantages that um, college people get from that connection is there's a potential for a research pool if you're a developmental psychologist. There's the opportunity if you've got really bright students that you're going to be recruiting them for your pipeline for your school, mm-hmm. uh, let alone you're helping build the pipeline whether they go to your school or not. And so trying to make sure that we are producing high-quality psych graduates, uh, high-quality psych students at the high school level. Uh, I think there's, there's a reward in being able to work more directly on the pipeline. The pipeline issue is one of the things I uh, have been somewhat consumed by in the last few years. Yeah, talk to us about, about that. What's, where, where's your head at with that? Um, a lot of what I've been doing for APA, uh, in part because I started out at Alverno and I have this very skills-oriented approach, I have been involved in virtually every standard-setting project that involves psychology curriculum since they started doing that. And uh, I've joked that sometimes I have outcomes or us printed on my forehead, but I really do think in terms of outcomes. It's really easy for me. And when I hear people say, I don't get outcomes, like uh, it, it's so second nature for me, then it's hard for me to understand why it's so hard for you to, you're a psychologist, break it down, it's behavior. What behavior are you looking for? Mm. Um, so I think the, uh, the, the projects that I've been doing lately um, – the the one that's not quite crossed the finish line yet is looking at outcomes at the master's level, which is uh, one of the most neglected and maligned areas in psychology. Mm. Uh, PhD-level psychologists tend to feel a little bit threatened by master's-level people who might be out there practicing, and as a consequence, the master's person has not had the kind of support clarification of expectations, what should you be able to do with the master's. So I was part of uh, a group that I think the next APA will be a formal adjudication by council on whether or not they're going to sign off on the proposal that we have that extends guidelines 2.0 to the master's level. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Will will that be published as a separate? It will be published as a separate document. Yeah. 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 Okay. But, But a lot of political challenge, in part because... The word assessment Mm -hmm. means something a little bit different to PhD-level clinician people. They think about that as psychodiagnostic testing, and uh, and it can be it can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, My very first project in this was the high school, the very first high school standards. I was one of the two college consultants Mm. on that project with the person most responsible for. who I am temperamentally in teaching, and that's Bill McKeechee of mm. University of Michigan. He yeah. and I consulted. Uh, we bonded over time and uh, remained very close friends oh. as a result of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you have been... I didn't realize you were involved in master's level APA yep. teaching stuff as I, well. I've yeah. actually been involved with publications now at every level if the master's piece gets approved. I did some work on the competent clinician hmm. uh, that was published and trying to articulate how it is that psychology practitioners are different than social workers um, and was able to keynote at a national conference to help clinicians think through this issue. So I've, I mean, I've, I've had absolutely remarkable opportunities because of my affiliation with APA and the fact that I had this bizarre background in mm-hmm. outcomes from El Verona. And have you, have you taught uh, PhD level students I as have. well. Yeah, and master's level. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so what's your favorite? Oh, if I had to pick if I had to pick a favorite today, I'm going to say I've always favored intro. Uh-huh. Because so much magic can happen as you introduce people to that world. Just like the magic happened for me, my goal is to try to recreate that magic as best I can for any student taking intro and the secondary goal of snagging the good ones to become majors. That's what I try to do. <laughs> yeah. Manipulate them into yeah. being majors. Good. Yeah. yeah no. But I, I will say um, probably uh, whatever it is I'm teaching at the moment is my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Do, do you think that any, 
your love of intro psych and trying to find that magic with students has anything to do with your experience with that one teacher in intro psych when you were uh, an undergraduate? I do. Um, I think, I think I was in awe mm-hmm. of him. I, I was in awe of how he assembled his knowledge. And he was a straight lecturer, so again, I didn't model. There was another teacher in the department who was much more dynamic and active learning, and, and I learned a lot about technique from that person. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have to say the, the um, enthusiasm and the power of narrative and story I learned from him. Um, and I certainly carry that through when I see my students flagging in attention. I, I whip out a story and get them back on track. And, and I know that is um, a reflection of uh, Bill Hepler, who's still with us. And I, that's a call out to him. I'll let him know I mentioned him. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, I've had a, uh, I've had a glass and a half of wine, so, so now I'm falling asleep. And I want you to, <gasps> right now, I want you to tell me, <laughs> tell me one of the stories you dig out for intro psych. I'm going to put you on the spot. We'll oh, s- sure. And we'll edit it if, if you... If you <laughs> just totally can't come up with anything, we'll just no, pretend no, this I, never happened. Can, can I come up with anything? You know, You're not a talker. Pour, oh, pff, yeah. Pour yourself a big glass because I've got lots of stories. <laughs> um, I would say one of the stories, I'm going to tell two stories. I'll tell a short one and then I'll tell the more poignant one. Mm-hmm. Um, the short one is I love to tell students in intro how I overcame snake phobia. Uh, and my snake phobia was m- mighty severe. Um, I, I have a scar on my leg from a snake. From a bite? And, and I noticed I paused because I've told the story enough that I know people will say, a snake bit you? No. Um, <laughs> I was walking through a field and I stepped in the middle of a coiled snake. <gasps> and much like a Warner Brothers cartoon, we both shot up about three feet eyeball to eyeball contact and it scared me so badly I ran into a barbed wire fence but it was his fault so that's why I call it a snake scar (laughs) so terrified of snakes Um, and then I I married a man who insisted that he wanted to live in the country Hmm. (laughs) and so there are snakes in the country you may know that there are snakes in the country Mm -hmm. Uh, and I like to garden but the prospect of running into snakes was a little bit of a problem And so once when I was out in the garden, I had a roll of mulch. I picked up the roll of mulch. Sure enough, a snake crawls out of the roll of mulch. This is in Florida? This is back in Wisconsin. Oh, Wisconsin. Okay. Um, And I I had such an anxiety attack that uh, it it was, I went in the house and said, we're moving because I can't, I can't live here. There are snakes here. And so he, um, he laughed. He was a psych major. (laughs) And he said, I think it's time that we do something about that. I said, okay. Um, so he waited until I had foot surgery and couldn't run. That's a critical piece of the story. Oh, my. Here we go. Well, your imagination is going places that won't be right, but okay. I do like to set up the story okay. that way. Um, he said, okay, we're going to fix your snake phobia. And I said, I'm, I'm on crutches. What are you talking about? He said, no, here's the thing. I found a snake in the garden, and it's a big one. And I shot it. I'm sorry to tell you, but I shot it. And I've stretched him out so he looks like a big stick, not a snake. And you're going to walk to him, and you're going to touch him. He's dead. He can't, he can't do what you're afraid of, which is wiggle across your toes. That's the, you know, phobics usually have some specific thing they're worried mm. about. And so I said, oh, this is awful. And he said, but we're going to do it right mm. because you're going to take a couple steps and I'm going to give you a hug for every couple steps you take. <laughs> and so every, what normally would take me about a minute to get to where the snake was, it took me 45 minutes because I would take a couple steps and then I'd have to shudder. Wow. And by the time I got there, it didn't look like a snake. It looked like a big stick, mm-hmm. but I could take my crutch and bump him. And, you know, it's a snake. And then slowly I'm reaching down. He's patting me reaching down, I touch him. Oh, you know, he's not slimy. He's not what I'm thinking. Yeah. And something powerful happened in that moment in, in vivo that two months later I was in Australia and I was at a ranch and I was petting a big snake that somebody had wrapped around his neck. Wow. So the, the power of a learning paradigm, um, is amazing. Mm. And I will say one of the classes when I told that story, the next time I came back into class, wrapped around the podium was about a 12-foot stuffed snake, which is, you got to love students. Right? So good. Yeah. So that's the short story. <laughs> uh, the more poignant story is one that 
um, made me decide to take up positive psychology as a teacher, hmm. and that is the fact that uh, uh, four years ago my house burned down. And it's an awful story, and I hope nobody has to go through it. Um, the, the house was declared a total loss. Hmm. It was not, in fact, a total loss because my husband, in his underwear, um, used the garden hose to wet down the house while we're waiting for the fire trucks to arrive. And um, I like to tell students that in the midst of this awful situation, I looked at my husband in his underwear holding the garden hose, and I thought, you know, he's kind of hot. <laughs> And I love looking at the looks on their faces when they're saying, she's talking sexually about her husband? In the, No, this is a really good example of attribution theory, arousal theory. I mean, we can use that as an example of a lot. Yeah, great um, learning moment. It is a good learning moment, but mm -hmm. even more powerfully, that became um, such an experience for me of um, gratitude and resilience. Mm. I mean, I, I, I knew I liked... I knew I liked my peers, I knew I liked my students, but I was stunned at the largesse and the generosity that people showed me in the aftermath of that tragedy. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I use that to start. I explain the first day of positive psychology. I do a slideshow. Here it was used to be my house. Here's what my house looked like two hours into the fire, and tell the story. And um and students, for some reason, there's this one place in the slideshow that reliably gets them, it's, it's where we show the vinyl record collection on the lawn. They all go, oh! I said, okay, now, I showed you my house demolished, and you respond to the vinyl record collection. Why? It's just the most reliable phenomenon. So we have a discussion about why did that grab you more yeah. than anything else that I've told you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So do you, you self-disclose lots in your teaching? It's fine. Um, I'm, I can't say that I disclose... Uh, I want to say this carefully. I have advised people to be careful about what they disclose. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that from the standpoint of the times I've been an administrator, I've seen people get into trouble from disclosing and forgetting that sometimes the people we're teaching we can find in the DSM yeah. and that some of them m may be up to no good with the information that they know about you. And I've been involved administratively in cases. I've been involved in court in cases like that. Wow. Um, but I'm, I'm usually pretty careful. I don't say a whole lot about my husband other than his underwear. Um, uh, I try to respect his privacy. Um, it, it, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of selective about yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. And I imagine with your clinical background, you probably are even more so. Maybe. It's, that's true. Yeah. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, there is no way we're going to get through everything, but we will. I want to go back to, uh, well, which means we have to have you on again. Oh, okay. For second season. Oh, I'm, yeah, sure. I, I have no idea. Round two. Um, so Alverno, Alverno College is where we left off. Yeah. And, um, and so you, at this point, you started, um, that's where your undergraduate was. That's where I... Oh, that's a, that was your first teaching job. That was my job. first teaching job. Your first yeah. teaching job. So, so we, have, we have to go back a little bit further then. Mm -hmm. um, so in your, in your graduate program, when mm -hmm. you are... Um, how long did it take you to figure out that, that you... Or at what point did you go from clinician to teacher? Was it right away? No, I was... Because you, you finished out as a clinician. I finished out as a clinician. I started as a clinician. Right. Um, and there was no provision to be a teacher in right. that program. Okay. The, the assumption was if you were going to be an academic, uh, you're going to do research, and then you'll go get a, a research-oriented job, but you didn't have teacher training of okay. any kind. Okay. So then, um, so when you got the, how did you find out about Alverno? Uh, I read a, oh, the person who hired me for the special school okay. was reading the one ads in um, the monitor, and he read out loud, well, this is an interesting job. And when he finished reading it, he looked at me and said, I think I just made an error. <laughs> and I said, mm, maybe so, because then I applied. Because he knew. He knew that that would be a good match for me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so I applied and got the job. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so 17 years there, did, were you an administrator there, or did you just I teach? was. Um, I taught uh, a full load my first year, and because fate is weird, I became head of the department in my second year. Yeah. Um, 
strangely, we have so many things in common. Is that right? My second year is this full time tenure track job. I mean, it's only two two okay. person but department. But yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Very, very, very interesting. But we're we're rare. I mean, it's rare that you have that kind of opportunity. Well, and you, how many people did? You, how many people? Oh, in your, at your the department? time, the department was pretty small. I think there were maybe five people in the yeah. department. A little yeah. tiny. It was, there were ten or eleven by the time I left. Yeah, I'm noting things that we have in common because I did my background in in. Uh, in I'm a marriage and family therapist, mm-hmm. and I fell into teaching. And then loved it. And I also, my first kind of job that had anything to do with psychology was working with uh, intellectually and physically disabled Oh, folks. look at that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That yeah. Just, so as you're talking, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking like all these, these parallels. So, um, so you, did you have any, did you get out of the classroom completely when you became an administrator? No, never. Oh, okay. I've never been out of the classroom mm-hmm. in all the roles that I've had. Okay. Because you've been a dean. I, I have been re- a dean. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. I'm a I'm a recovering dean now. <laughs> <laughs> Never again? Uh no, I'm 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 all done. My my life plan was that I would I would do the dean thing and then uh when retirement was coming close I wanted to go back to the classroom because I wanted I wanted to have that uh special feeling again uh in a more intense way and I've really been satisfied with that in the last couple of years. Right. And you you told me you're going to a 3-3 for the first time in forever. For, yeah, since I since my first year of teaching was a full teaching load. So my it'll be my first Oh, shot so you've of, had release from uh, second. I've, absolutely. <laughs> I've had year Yeah, time. I've either taught two classes or one class every semester since my second year of teaching and that's I think this falls either th- number 37 or 38. I've lost track. Good. Yeah. So when you were a dean, was it typical that you would be a dean and teach? It, I made it a requirement uh-huh. when I hired in. I said I, um, I have to keep that alive. And I think I'm a little suspicious of deans who don't teach because you lose touch with, um, with what you're there for. Mm-hmm. And also, as a dean, you end up seeing students, uh, you, you go to a ward dinner, so you see great students, but you don't have personal conversations with them. You tend to have personal conversations with the, the students who are in big-time trouble instead. And I wanted to teach so that I had a good feel for the students. And someone wisely said, why don't you teach the honors intro class? And I said, oh, my gosh, that would be per- uh, uh, that'd be perfect. Mm-hmm. And so for the 10 years that I was dean, teaching the honors intro class, um, it, it gave me the illusion that all my students were that smart. I, all, all UWF students were that smart. <laughs> <laughs> you still teach that class, don't you? I do. I yeah. teach that class. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of fun, I bet. It's, it's terrific. Yeah. They're delightful, small, delightful students. Small class, too. Um, the honors classes are designed for 15, and I usually ask for 20 because I, I like that size of class. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah good. Um, well, we have, uh, we have, I don't know, I don't know, a few minutes left. And mm-hmm. so, um, I know that we're just, we're not going to get into career stuff today. Probably, probably won't, won't, won't make it like as, as far as your contributions to the teaching of psychology are very big. And so I'd like to save that maybe for another time. Okay. And, uh, and probably Eric would like to be involved in that too. Oh, I'd um, love that. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be a lot of fun. Um, but I do, I did hear just a, a couple things that I want to ask you about before, before we leave in. Can you talk about the magic of teaching? Because you have mentioned the word magic uh-huh. like three or four times. I'm sure this isn't the first time you've talked about it. And uh, so I'd like you to maybe for, for all, I don't know, let's just, let's just go with it. Okay. Mad, the magic of teaching. Why is that such a big metaphor for me yeah, is what yeah. you're asking. Yep. Uh, it is important for me. Um, in the year 2000, when I was serving as president of STP, mm-hmm. um, you had the opportunity to do a presidential talk. And uh, the talk I did was called Teaching as Alchemy. Hmm. And... Sometimes you throw talks together, but boy, I worked my butt off on that talk. And that's where I discovered that I really was talking about magic all the way through, mm-hmm. that um, in the right circumstances, when you, when you as a teacher at the end of a class, you feel like you want, you're, you're flying. Mm-hmm. It's because there's something that's very special that's happened mm-hmm. in that particular mixture of people, that time, that place. Mm-hmm. Um, and my goal when I'm mentoring people, uh, new teachers, is to try to help them figure out what it is they do that produces that powerful experience. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, it, it's a metaphor that means a lot. So is it more than a metaphor? Do you think something is actually happening in between your 
in, in that space? And like, because I know that it doesn't happen every time, right? So it, what's going on? It doesn't happen every time, um, but it happens reliably enough mm-hmm. that I know that there's uh, there are variables that predict. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's not going to happen if I'm cranky. <laughs> I'm not cranky very often. Um, it's, uh, it's likely to happen. I mean, one of the, one of the interesting things about teaching is if you have a, there, there's a, a phrase called the spirit of the staircase, that mm. if you're walking to your class and you get an idea like, you know, I could do this differently. And you try it without giving a lot of thought to it. Usually those classes are so much better than the things that you have rehearsed and rehearsed down to a science because you're bringing something fresh to it. Mm. Um, so I think there's a, a novelty piece to it. Um, sometimes it depends on, uh, the particular mix of personalities of Mm -hmm. students that you have, Mm -hmm. um, and the degree to which you have gotten students to buy into the fact that you're building a learning community that they are all responsible for, Mm -hmm. um, all of those things count toward making really memorable experiences. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, No, I think about those, uh, those variables and, um, I had a class this year that was, uh, in an, it was an afternoon. It was a hybrid. So I saw them only once a week, but it was three thirty in the afternoon. I got a lot of high school students who were taking college classes yeah. after they'd been in high school all day. Yeah. So they come for a hybrid class and once beat, a week. They're beat. Sleepy. And it took me about three or four weeks to figure mm-hmm. out what was going on. But there, <laughs> there was very little magic, but we did get there by the end of the quarter. Yeah. Uh, but there and were, did you, did you stop and ask them to help you figure it out or did you just figure it out? I figured it out. It was it was honestly the hardest class I've ever taught, mm-hmm. and um, and so I was I was a, at a bit of a loss. And in fact, my old institution, um, this would have been one of the things that I'd really talked through with my department. Now moving to a much smaller department mm-hmm. where there wasn't as much day to day just conversation about teaching. Um, it. it I I do identify with people who kind of feel like they're on their own. Mm -hmm. Um, Not that I don't have great people around me. It's just not as consistent. So, um, but you know, at the, by the end of the quarter, I'd figured it out. It took the pressure off once I figured it out. And then I could, um, I, I I probably mentioned something to them when I, when I sorted that out, but um, yeah. So now I've got on the schedule next year, I have a, 3.30 3.30 afternoon hybrid class that I'm going to definitely be changing and, and because I don't think it's good for anybody. I don't think they learned probably what they needed to and I sure didn't enjoy it. That was a really difficult oh, yeah. class right. for me. Right. Um, yeah, so the magic of teaching. Okay, that, that's number one. Number two, uh, did you, when, when you look at your life and your career now, um, is there anything from your childhood, maybe your you mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned your relationship with your father. You mentioned being a tomboy. You mentioned your, um, your, you know, what did you call it? Lower, um, middle class family, but also your personality, um, your grit, whatever. Mm-hmm. Did you, do you see that any of those things were always with you? That no. You, no. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. I, and I'm, I mean, it's surprising that I answered that quickly. Uh-huh. Um, but I was temperamentally, and this will be stunning for people who know me. I was the shyest child on the planet. I grab your mother's skirts, hide behind no. her. Oh yeah, yeah. And I was, um, I was highly anxious as a child. Huh. And I think I was, I was, I worried about everything. Uh, I remember, I remember somebody throwing a cigarette out of the car in front of us and and saying to my father, "Could our car blow up because of that?" And and he would look at me and say, it's highly unlikely or something. Um, I worried that we would run out of music. I mean, I manufactured <laughs> things to worry about. And I'm not at all like that now. Um, I don't worry about much, and I'm hardly shy. Uh-huh. Um, I also was terrified about public speaking. Mm. Uh, so, so much so that in college, when it was required a mm-hmm. required course in public speaking. I took it at the university in my hometown rather than my regular school wow. so that when I flunked it, nobody at my regular school would know how badly I did. Yeah. Yeah. I got over that. <laughs> and, and that does influence teaching decisions I make. Day one, every student in my class says something right. because I want them to hear their voice in my class mm-hmm. day one. It's going to make it easier to get 
participation going. Mm-hmm. Most of my classes, I require students to give speeches. Yeah. And that's all, uh, the only way you can get over this phobia is you got to do it. Mm-hmm. And you got to do it with a friendly audience. And so we're going to train the audience to be friendly, and we're going to give you the parameters for how to be successful, and, and you won't have to throw up before you give talks. <laughs> that's my goal. Undoubtedly. Uh, yeah. it, it probably has to do with... Uh, the fact that you value skills so much in, yeah. in, in psychology as well, in teaching psychology. Um, okay. Well, I just have maybe, maybe a couple more quick ones that came out of the last five minutes of you talking. All so right. um, maybe just one more. So there <laughs> are, you, you've given a lot of talks over the years. And I you, have. you talked about um, working really hard on the talk. And by the way, is there a copy of the Teaching as Alchemy talk? Yes, there is. Um, and I can thank Elizabeth Hammer for this. Oh kind of a surprise. Uh Uh, Elizabeth, back when she was at Belmont University, asked me, could I convert this into print somehow so that they could distribute it to somebody at Belmont? And so I I did convert that into print, and I've got, well, there we go. I might have a copy of it. It might be in the burned up house. (laughs) Oh, really? You don't know? I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd all, that, this happens all the time to people who have houses burned. It's like, do I have that or not? I don't know if I have that anymore. Oh, my goodness. Um, okay, note but to I self. Did find Email, the, yeah, Jane. I did find the, over, the overhead slides from the talk not too long ago. Those didn't burn up. Um, yeah, that was an important oh, talk for me. Oh, what a bummer. Yeah. Okay, well, hopefully, hopefully they exist still. Yeah. Um, so uh, a lot of teachers talk every day, obviously, and, um, but I'm talking more about uh, talks that you're giving – um, let's say a lot of the um, high school teachers here, they do trainings or, Mm -hmm. and a lot of people here, they give talks. So what, do you have any, what are your, from giving so many talks over the years, what, (laughs) what are the, what is the key to a good talk? Oh, is it the same as a key to a good lecture or class? I think there, I think, mm, I'm going to say no to that because uh, if you're, well, no, I'm going to take that back. I once heard someone describe my success as a, a convention speaker or a conference speaker is that I make the audience do the work. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Say more about that. That um, I create a structure that uh, normally if you've got a 50-minute period, I'm going to build in audience actions, audience discussion pieces, so that I know I'm not really responsible for 50 minutes. I'm responsible for creating an infrastructure that will allow people to exchange and have some interesting opinions. Now, that means I don't know how it's going to turn out. Yep. And I'm, I, I trust my ability to make connections with what people are going to say mm-hmm. or to make it into fun, mm-hmm. to have to turn it into a joke or have it remind me of a story or something that I'm, it, it, I, I'm willing to go with that. So yep. yeah, I yep. think that is, that is characteristic. Well, and your, and your personality is pretty loose, so you can, <laughs> yeah. you can roll with it. Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. my uh-huh. personality's loose. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, and so, so giving, do you think that's a, that's a, I, I'm, I'm maybe not for Jane Hallinan, but for the average person who's giving and preparing a talk to have some flexibility in your talk or to involve the audience, that I, act of learning well, I think principle. If you can involve the audience, mm-hmm. even if it's as simple as how many of you have this experience, raise your hand, look around um, so that you have the audience come together in the sense that you're creating a, a learning community right there. Right. Yeah. Um, that would be important. I also think, um, uh, being able not to take yourself too seriously, mm-hmm. figuring out where there can be some things that you can inspire some laughter yep. helps. Um, and then good visuals are good. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, a long, long career, um, has made you able, I, I think makes it easier for you to, uh, to not take yourself so seriously. Absolutely. A long successful career. Yes. Um, and I know you talked, you talked about teaching awards before and, you have a teaching award named, named after is you, Is that the coolest sake. thing or not? It that, is so cool. It is very cool. How, how did that happen? Um, Bill Buskist, uh-huh. I love him in the, at the same level I love Stephen Chu. I'm just going to say that. Mm-hmm. Uh, is someone who considers me a mentor. And once upon a time at a... Con- I think it was at a MacTop conference. It might have been. Uh, he introduced Steve Davis who hasn't been in the teaching community for a while, and me as his grandparents. And Steve and I were 
a little floored by that because we're not that much older <laughs> than Bill. Um, but one of the things I did for Bill, at least this is what he says, is that I brought him into STP. Hmm. That I said, there are people you got to meet, and I'm going to make sure that you meet them. And he became active. He later became a president. And in his presidential year, he called me and said, um, I'm going to ask you something. I think, I, I think you're probably going to tell me no if I know you. Um, but I, I have an opportunity to name a teaching award for uh, early career people teaching in psychology, and I'd like to name it after you. And I said, well, you don't know me very well because I'm going to say, hot damn, let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, In in part because uh, as a female, Uh I mean, this is rare. This is totally rare. And the fact that it was um, pitched as an honor for my mentoring generations of leaders in the teaching of psychology, I, I couldn't think of, I mean, it's one of the best things in my life. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, just to s- circle back to where we started, one of the first things you mentioned was, you know, being one of the only women there. And now, uh, when they go to name a teaching award, there are not many women. There are, there are. First of all, there are not many like highly successful teachers of psychology. Um, it's a very limited pool. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Of of people, and you have. You have continued through the decades to be involved and to be that face. And I have no doubt that there are many women who uh, are inspired by what you do. Uh, trust me, there are many men who are inspired by what you've done as well. <laughs> and many men who want to get your award, right? Yes, but, but, and yeah. I'd, I'd love that. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah, yeah, and, and many have. But, yeah. um, but Many great ones, by the many way. Many great ones. I, yeah. Uh, but... What an awesome thing for... Maybe it was you who flipped this thing and now there's way more women psychologists. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it wasn't me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it wasn't me. But yeah. Well, uh, you know, it has been so good to have you here. Really, it has been. And, yeah, it's been you know, fun. I love to do these these talks, but this is a special one. And, and we tried hard, didn't we, to get this thing going because I tried to have you out to Seattle <laughs> and that... The disaster Western tour of 2017. How how often does weather just shut down airports around you? In Pensacola, um, it it doesn't happen too often, but it happened on that disaster weekend that Delta had, and so the two events that I had coordinated very carefully. Oh, it's so, perfect. Yeah, our MPA one day and your conference uh-huh. the next day, and I spent um, more time in the airport than I care to and then trying to deliver them digitally. That was okay, but I have to say I've never had the experience of doing a digital talk and having to stop it in the middle because of the fire drill. Which did happen at Tib Northwest. Yeah, 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 that happened. Yeah, so quite memorable. It was memorable for us as well. I hope so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sue and I put on, and uh, you weren't there for it because you no, were outside of your. Building, I was outside but, w- pacing. But but we put on, a, and with Ruth Rickle, I think as well, we put on an impromptu talk. Yeah. Uh, for about twenty minutes, and then we, <laughs> you're, yeah, you're. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, hold on, I, I have multiple <laughs> thoughts at once, but but uh, we're we've, we're looking at the empty desk for twenty minutes. Yeah. Wondering. Will she come back? I think I put the mute button on so we didn't have to hear the fire alarm. But um, the thought I was having was, were you having like these flashbacks of I hope my school doesn't... When, when you have fire alarms, do you think about that now? And, In fact, yeah. um, um, my friends who were there uh, came to me and said, are you okay? Oh my <laughs> said, yes, but there is something about fire in me that's not good. And, yeah. and they watched me pace and they said, well, how did, how did your talk go? I said, I'm in the middle of my talk. You're in the middle of your talk right now? <laughs> yes. That's not good. No. no. <laughs> oh, it wasn't good. I think I, I think I probably was sweating a lot during, uh-huh. yeah, during yeah. that moment. But you know what? Uh, you showed back up on camera. Yeah. You, you cut off our talk our impromptu talk, but it, it turned out really well. Yeah. And, uh, it was a very memorable event for people and sometimes they need that. And well, I hope the, con- I hope any of the content penetrated instead of, instead of that Helen and gave a talk and, and, and she got interrupted by a fire, you know, do you, you know, remember when the I, minutia or do you, yeah. <laughs> when I listen to you talk, I'll tell you what, I, uh, I, I know I learned something, um, but mostly I look forward to it because I have a lot of fun when I hear you talk. Oh. So, yeah, and that's, that's what it was for Tip Northwest. I think we had a lot of fun. Okay. You just naturally bring such a joy to teaching. So thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. Um, man, we look, we, we look forward to uh, many years of your influence on the teaching of psychology. And, uh, yeah, thanks, Jane. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>